Well, thank you everybody for joining us. I'm Father Chris Alar, one of the Miriam priests here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, coming to you live on the last Saturday of the month. Uh, this is a beautiful day here in Stockbridge. Uh, we're glad if you can't join us in person that you're with us for this 107th episode. Woo! Uh, I've been killing poor brother Mark here, but uh, God bless you guys for joining us. 107 episode, and I think one of the best and most favorite for me because it puts to rest a lot of misconceptions. Now, we talked about taking you back to seminary. I am absolutely, I, I loved the seminary years or the greatest years of my life. I loved it more than anything I've ever done in my life. And I said, I want to take you back to seminary with me. Well, this class is church history. And seminarians have to take church history. And boy, did we talk about the Inquisition. I'd like to thank uh, some of the other people that I used data to get from their books, Chris Sparks, Steve Weinkoff, uh, Warren Carroll, many others. So God bless you for joining us on this most misunderstood, along with probably the Crusades, which we already have a video on, and Galileo, which I hope to do sometime in the future. So let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that you send the Holy Spirit down upon us. Forgive us our transgressions of the past. Give us the mercy to walk upright in the future. We ask that you wrap the, our lady, wrap her blessed mantle around us to guide us and protect us. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so I wrote this talk. Um, I collected a bunch of data earlier last week. I got my notes, worked with our theologian Chris Sparks. But I wrote this in the airport, on the plane, and in the car. So if I do not have uh, all everything perfect, uh, well, <laughs> at least you know why. So anyway, we're talking about this myth. And I will start by calling it a myth. Now, I'm going to go, there's some good work here by a John Sorensen of Catholic Answers. Really good. Catholic Answers is good stuff. If you haven't used them, they are great. Now, there is a BBC documentary. And don't think the BBC would be likely to publish something like this because of the liberal media around the world, but they did, called The Myth of the Spanish Inquisition. I'm gonna give you some of the myths, and then we're gonna back up and tell you what it was. So, this is really amazing. The Inquisition, let's start with some of the myths right up front, and then we'll, I guess I said, address them. First of all, do you know that the jails, which everybody has this vision of these torture chambers and dungeons and rats, do you know that the Inquisition actually had the best jails in all of Spain. They were the best ones. Prisoners in the secular courts and jails would actually blaspheme, blaspheme against the church so that they could be transferred to the church inquisition prisons. This is a fact. It's on the BBC. And they would escape the mistreatment of the secular prisons. They were treated much better in the inquisition prisons. What about witchcraft? Oh, we all know the story of the Catholic bishops pointing up to the poor woman falsely accused of witchcraft being burned at the stake. We all know that story, don't we? Right? Well, you want to know the real truth? No, the church isn't perfect. Trust me, at the end of this talk, for all those who watched the first 10 minutes and then sent me angry emails, please watch to the end. We are going to discuss the church's fault in this as well. But persecuting witchcraft was a craze in Europe at the time. The secular courts, meaning the state, they were not tolerant of witchcraft, all right? The accused were often burned at the stake. Nobody argues that, but listen to this. The Inquisition, listen to this, on the other hand, declared witchcraft a delusion. And in the church, no one could be tried for it or burned at the stake. Did you know that? Don't believe me. Don't, you don't have to believe me. This is right on the BBC. Fascinating that nobody knows this. All right. <clears throat> no priest. I bet you didn't know this. 
All these things of monks surrounded as the person's burning at the stake. No priest or religious could take an active role in torture by church law. Now, that doesn't mean there wasn't some rogue priest somewhere out in the forest that partook in it. But church law was they could not. They could not. Let's take a look at our next slide. Okay. Many Inquisition courts, you know what their major focus was? Oh, here's a great one for you. Maybe we should bring them back. You know what their major focus was? Focusing on the clergy and their living impurely and their dissidents of the clergy. Many, many Inquisition courts, that was their major focus, was, living on the life, was focusing on the lifestyle of the priest. Nobody talks about that. All right? Rather than the laity, the focus was on the priests. All right? The 16th century, this was the height. Okay, listen to this one. In the entire 16th century, the Inquisition in Spain... You know how many people were executed? This is according again to the BBC. One account, 95 million. Another count that I just saw on Patheos, uh, 5 million. You know how many people were executed in the 16th century in Inquisition in Spain? 50. 50. A proven fact which is contrary to this black legend that's floating out there, which the numbers and executions they say were in the hundreds of thousands, if not the millions. False. Now, let's talk more about this. Of all the inquisitions together, now remember, there were three kind of major categories of inquisitions. The Spanish was one. So that was right. I was talking about the 50. But of all the inquisitions together throughout Europe, Again, according to the BBC, scholars now say that the number of people in total, grand total, executed over 350 years. Ask non-Catholics, millions. One, one account even said into the billions. <laughs> there was, wasn't even that many people in Europe. You couldn't even kill that many because that many people didn't even exist. But the total, grand total... According to modern scholars, 3,000. Some say as many as 5,000. Now, again, for those poor people, this isn't justifiable if they were innocent. And we're not claiming that. We're not claiming it was wrong to harm those three to 5,000 people. But it's a big, far cry difference from 95 million. Okay? So these averages, now take a load of this. Now, if you have 3,000 3, to 5,000 and average that over 350 years, that comes out to about 14 people per year in each of these categories. Wow. 14 people per year versus 95 million. Hmm. Now, here's a big one for you. Again, according to the scholars. You know the punishment that was carried out on these people? It's not carried out by the church. Now, that doesn't mean, again, there wasn't some rogue bishop or some rogue priest that did punish these people. Nobody is arguing that. But the punishment was not carried out by the church, but the proven fact, it was carried out by the nation states of France, Spain, and Italy by the monarchies. And it didn't start with the Catholic Church. Everybody says the Inquisition started with the Catholic Church. Actually, the ideology started with Roman law. <clears throat> Fascinating concepts here. All right, more misunderstood myths. Many fundamentalists believe that more people died in the Inquisition than any war or any plague. This is stated by one popular book, in a, a fundamentalist claims, as I said, 95 million people died under the Inquisition. But here's the point, everybody. Inquisition did not exist in Northern Europe, Eastern Europe, Scandinavia, or England. It was only in the southern part of France, Italy, and Spain, and a few parts of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, again, the Inquisition could not have killed that many people because not that many people lived in those parts of Europe where they had the Inquisition. Amazing. 
All right, so now let's get into, I wanted to give you some of these myths up front. Now let's get into what was it? What was the Inquisition? Why did it happen? Okay, again, good resources. Warren Kiro, Stephen Weinkampf, you have Chris Sparks, you have Catholic Answers. They have actually really come to a lot of similar conclusions here. Fact, scholarship, history. Now, there have been several different inquisitions. The first was in 1184 in France as a response to heresy. The Catharists, this was heresy. This was known as the Medieval Inquisition, all right? Now, separate from that was the Roman Inquisition of 1542. This is the least known, the most or least effective um, in terms of uh, well being well known. And let's go to our next slide. The infamous Spanish Inquisition, which started in 1478. Now, what is it? All right. It started in 1478, a state institution is, was used to identify conver conversos, conversos. What does that mean? Jews and Muslims. It was not against Protestants. The target was Jews and Muslims who pretended to convert to Christianity for political or social advantage, but secretly continued to practice their former religions. So it really wasn't even against Protestants. So actually the targets were the Jews and the Muslims. Kind of interesting. The various inquisitions, they stretch for centuries. Together we kind of call it the inquisition, meaning all of them. But the most famous, as I said, is the Spanish one. But here's the point. More importantly, its job was also to clear the names of those falsely accused of heresy. So the Inquisition did just as much to free people accused by the state than it did to condemn people and send them to the state. We don't hear about this. Yeah, the church, yeah, we got sinners. You know, the church is human and divine. In her divine nature, she won't fail in her teaching, but in her human nature, she can fail. You know, here's interesting. St. Paul and Christ himself warned us that there would be ravenous wolves among the church leaders. Again, thanks be to God that we got some groups of laity raising up now to be able to hold accountable. I just got a uh, text that there's a group now um, uh, in front of uh, the nuncio in Washington, D.C., really questioning why all the traditions with newest statements that are being made from church hierarchy about the traditions are for, for the dead. Well, if we don't have tradition, we don't have a church. So God bless some of the laity standing up. But Jesus and Paul said ravenous wolves would be among church leaders. Now, it's easy, however. Here's where we're going to get it a little touchy, so bear with me now. It's easy to see in some ways why those who led the Inquisition actually thought they were justified. Why? Boy, this is fascinating. <clears throat> the Bible itself, the Bible records where God commanded, but you've never heard this. God commanded a formal legal inquiry. Yes, inquisitions to be carried out to expose secret believers in false religions. I'm not claiming what the Inquisition did was good. I'm claiming that they had the understanding, but I think went about it the wrong way. But they thought they were following the Bible. This isn't of Satan necessarily. Yeah, they carried out maybe the wrong way. But listen to Deuteronomy 17, 2 through 5, if Brother Mark can put it on the screen. Listen to this. This is from the Bible. If there is found among you, this is God talking. If there is found among you within any of your towns, a man or woman who does what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God in transgressing his covenant and has gone and served other gods and worshiped them or the sun or the moon or any of the host of heaven, 
which I have forbidden. Catholics, we do not worship saints. It is, and it is told to you, and you hear of it. Then you shall inquire diligently. Note the phrase, inquire diligently. That means inquisition. And if it is true and certain that such an abominable thing has been done, then you shall bring forth to your gates that man or woman who has done this evil thing, and you shall stone that man or woman to death. End quote, God. Now, please don't send the letter to the bishop saying, I said to stone the heretics, okay? I'm telling you what's in Deuteronomy 17, chapter 2 through 5. Now, the church looked at that. And for example, the catharsists, these were a heresy. And this was very serious to the society at the time. Why? They were destroying social norms. In fact, they scorned marriage. This is a heretical group. The catharsts, they, they said marriage was evil. It was scorned because it legitimized sexual relations. I don't know how they thought they would reproduce, which they said was sinful. But then I read, oh, they allowed fornication. Oh, that's how they reproduced. They allowed fornication because they permitted it because they said it was just temporary and it was secret. It didn't publicly glorify the sinful act. This is crazy. They said marriage, you know, we can't have this. It's publicly sanctioned of sexual activity. Fornication's done in secret, so we're not publicly sanctified. Uh, San uh, what are you calling it? Um, sanctioning. <laughs> this is nuts. So the church had to step up, and the only way at the time they knew how to address such heresy was the way God told them in the Bible. Address them, hold an inquiry. We just read it in the book of Deuteronomy. Hold an inquiry. Identify these people and stone them to death. I am not, trust me, I am not saying to do that. Please don't send the letters. No, we're saying that this was their understanding. Okay, now, also to the catharists, ritualistic suicide was encouraged. Now, should we really let this kind of heresy continue openly in society? The Catharists refused to take oaths, which in the feudal society, which they had at that time, meant they were opposed to all government authority. Basically, this is chaos. They believed in chaos of society and government. Thus, Catharism is both a moral and a political danger to the church and to society. So here's the point, everybody. But efforts to address this heresy was disorganized. The church didn't know what to do. They knew they were called by God to do something. So let's look at our next slide. So what did they do? Pope Gregory IX responded. He took on the task of bringing the investigation of heresy under the discipline of the Holy See. Yes, nobody's going to deny this. Okay? What we term the Inquisition is simply this, an ecclesiastical, that means church, tribunal, with specially appointed judges, <clears throat> these are the inquisitors, answerable to both the local bishop and the pope. And their task was to investigate charges of heresy as God commanded in the Bible in a systematic and fair way. Now, it wasn't always done that way, Nobody's going to say it was, but sometimes it was. Many times it was. Now, why do we have this? Or why did they do this? Okay, in the Bible, back to the Bible, to protect the kingdom from such heresy, these secret members of false religions had to be rooted out and expelled from Israel. God commanded it. God's directive applied even to whole cities that turned away from the true religion. Don't believe me? Deuteronomy 13, verse 12 through 15. Like Israel, medieval Europe was a society of kingdoms. 
that were consecrated formally to God. So they thought they had to do the same thing. Again, not justifying it. The means don't justify the ends. But we're trying to explain why they thought they were actually doing God's work. So it's kind of understandable that Catholics would read their Bibles. Yes, oh, wait a minute. We're always attacked for not reading our Bibles. Here's a case where the Catholic hierarchy was reading the Bible. So wait a minute, which is it, non-Catholics? Are you, are you criticizing Catholics as we don't read the Bible? But wait a minute, when we just did read the Bible and we carried it out, then we're being even criticized greater. Again, the way to carry it out. Now, this is what was the conclusion. The conclusion was for the good of Christian society, like the Israelites, they must purge the evil from their midst. Again, scripture. Deuteronomy 13, 15, 17, 7. Paul reiterated this in 1 Corinthians 5, 13. People always ask, why is the Bible, do we just reject this part of the Bible? No, you have to understand the full context. All right, now, the Protestants also tried to root out and punish those they regarded as heretics. Did you know this? Now, I'm not trying to justify just the Catholic position, but I'm also trying to point out, do you know that there was a Protestant Inquisition too? Nobody talks about this. There was a Protestants also tried to root out and punish for the same reason. So they are just as justifiable in their understanding. Luther and Calvin both endorse the right of the state to protect the society by purging false religion. So everybody, it's not just Catholic. Not just Catholic. In fact, Calvin not only banished from Geneva those who did not share his views, he permitted in some cases and ordered others execution for heresy. I bet you didn't know that. You got it. Kelvin. Oh, Father, Calvin didn't execute anybody. Okay, Jacques Gouet who was tortured and beheaded in 1547. Michael Servetus, who was burned at the stake in 1553 by John Calvin. So what I'm saying here is like everything else, it's not just a Catholic problem. All right. Now, what about in England and Ireland? In England and Ireland, Protestant reformers engaged in their own ruthless inquisition and executions. It's not just Catholics. Thousands of English and Irish Catholics were put to death. Let me repeat that. Thousands of English and Irish Catholics were put to death. Many were hanged, drawn, and quartered for practicing the Catholic faith and refusing to become Protestant. Do you ever hear this? No. The fact that the Protestant reformers created inquisitions. They also did too to root out Catholics and others who did not fall in line with their doctrine shows that they cannot accuse Catholics for their wrongdoings here. They did the same thing. So this is important. Now, there's a good article there in Catholic Answers again by Robert Lockwood who I'd like to draw a little bit. I'm going to the theologians here. All right, what does he say? Now, the inquisition, he says, is a distorted historical understanding shared, of course, by non-Catholics, but do you know it's shared by most all Catholics? Most all Catholics, when pewed, uh, that pew surveys, all almost unanimously believe these myths that the church killed 95 million people, that the priests burned people at the stake. This is all false. But non-Catholics and Catholics believe it. You know, the Spanish Inquisition of the 13th and 14th centuries is the story of the church basically as the enemy of freedom, the enemy of science, basically burning heretics in these ghastly torture chambers, um, worked to these torture devices, worked by cackling monks. False. This is critically important. All right, rather than argue the current issues, you've all had this, like I was at an abortion clinic. We're standing there praying for the dignity of human life to be saved at the abortion clinic. This is a few years ago. 
and two guys are walking down the street, and I'm like, you know, pray for life. I have my sign, pray for life. And they're like, oh yeah, forget about abortion. What about the Crusades? And the other one says, yeah, forget about abortion. What about the Inquisition? What are we doing here? They, the, 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 the part of this anti-Catholic movement, and, and the Catholic Church is trying to teach current issues, we all face this. Oh, what about the Inquisition? All right. Many people know nothing, know nothing about what Inquisition courts were or what their purpose was. We're going to talk about that right now. From its inception, the church has had to confront those who persisted in representing beliefs as Christians when what they did or said contradicted the faith and the apostles. Boy, do we see that now today. Now, I'm not advocating what was done in the Inquisition, but I am advocating addressing heretics. Jesus told St. Faustina about heretics and schismatics. And this was way after the Inquisition ended. So Jesus tells us this. Now, early accounts contained in the Acts of the Apostles and St. Paul's letters describe the leadership of the infant church, the brand new church, responding to those falsely representing the faith. So when our Catholic politicians get up there and the nerve of one of our highest ranking Catholic politicians in the country to say, my Catholic faith tells me abortion is acceptable. And then this politician is granted holy communion. We're missing the whole point. Yeah, the Inquisition went way too far on one side, but now we're way too far on the other side. What we got to do is bring it together and say, God commands us to correct the sinner, to address the heretic. Now, we don't necessarily torture them. Of course not. Nobody's claiming that. Nobody is saying that. But to let them publicly get up there and say that my, my Catholic faith tells me and teaches that abortion is okay is insanity. That is a disgrace to the tradition of our faith. Man, sorry to get so worked up. Now, we must preserve, preserve the deposit of the faith that was sent down by the apostles. As Christianity became the faith of the Roman Empire and the Roman kingdoms, or the European kingdoms, the faith, listen to this, was understood as fundamental, unifying all of culture and the community. Guess what, everybody? That's what we've lost today. You want to know why the world's in the state that it is today? Because we no longer follow the natural law. The church doesn't have to cram her doctrines down your throat, but natural law, at least natural law, has to live. Now, if you do then open your heart to Catholic doctrine, you even excel that to a greater level. The natural law is based on the natural life here on earth. You want to become supernatural, then follow Christian doctrine, Catholic doctrine. But it's all been shut down. Now, to step outside of our faith at that time was to be viewed as a violation of unity. Don't we hear all this now from our politicians? Unity. We need unity. Well, all right, let's look at unity. When you stepped outside of the Christian tradition, you destroyed unity because the basis was the natural law of Christian principles. Now, this was a fundamental denial of the meaning of humanity and the right ordering of the world. Does this sound like the church should never have done anything? The problem today is the church isn't doing anything. It's taken our laity to stand up and do something. Now, to act against heresy was not considered just enforcing Catholic doctrine, but it was necessary for survival to the people of the Middle Ages. The whole basis of society was based on it. Heresy was seen as an evil that threatened that, the very salvation of souls and the heart of the community. What I'm trying to get through here is that you could, you, you know, when we eliminate history, you know, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm baffled at our elimination of history right now. 
School here on the East Coast took the name of a person off of one of their big buildings because their brother was a slave owner. You're not even looking at the fact that he didn't have anything to do with it. And secondly, we don't look at the context of the times. Our own Holy Father right now is in Canada apologizing profusely for these residential schools, okay? God bless. There were many things I'm sure that deserve apologies and should be apologized for, but do people really know the truth of what happened at the residential schools in Canada? And why is the church not saying this? For the protection of our own tradition. Do you know what happened at the residential schools? It was a tragedy. But you know what it started? The stripping of freedom in Canada. Parental rights were stripped and the children were forced to go to these residential schools against the will of the parents. Sound like something that's happening today? You betcha. The children were stripped. Parental rights were stripped. And the children were forced into huge numbers in these residential schools. Well, guess what? Many of the Native Americans had no natural immunity to disease. The disease of smallpox and other things. And so once they came together and forced these children together, the disease spread like wildfire. This wasn't the church hanging these poor Indians from trees or executing them as all the Canadians are being told right now and our Holy Father is apologizing for? Okay, I understand. Yes, let's apologize for any injustices that were done and the way it was handled. Well, these were not marked graves. Well, that's terrible because the church couldn't afford the markers. They had not a penny, but they tried to give them the biggest dignity they could by at least burying them. They were not mass graves. They were buried individually. I'm not saying there wasn't problems or there wasn't misdeeds. What I'm saying is the picture is totally different than what the media is portraying. I've read articles online that are saying the Catholic nuns used to kill the children in the back rooms and then secretly bury the bodies at night. This is unbelievable. This is slander. And if you are engaging in such a thing, you are committing a major sin of slander because you don't have the information. Please do some real research and not from anti-Catholic propaganda. Do it from the truth. This is what's going on right now. So, we have to understand and protect the church, but yet at the same time, yes, mistakes were made. Again, I can't emphasize enough that nobody is denying that. Was there some native children abuse? Yes, I'm sure there was. But the mass graves of hundreds of dead children were not being murdered. They, were, they died by disease because the government forced them into these residential schools against their will, against the parents' will, and the disease spread. That's how they died. Wow. Now, heresy threatens not only salvation of souls, but the heart of the community. It was out of this understanding, shared between the church and the state, that they should look for a means to preserve the true faith. Now, the church, they tried to remain independent, all right, but was trumped by secular authorities of the state. Again, everybody, I know I'm going to get so many angry emails on this. Look up the facts. Look at true scholarly history on this. You've got to go to the primary documents, not just some anti-Catholic um, part-time, self-proclaimed author. There was never really something called, as I said, the total inquisition. <clears throat> One unified the inquisition, functioning throughout all of Europe down into the centuries, never really was one unified inquisition. They were separate. By definition, they were local. They started with ecclesial investigations. Yes, they did. Nobody denies that. It is true that they started with investigation and trials conducted and overseen by the church. Okay, again, nobody denies this. These inquisitions, however, rarely were ongoing. Do you know that decades could go by, nothing would happen? In England, in England, the inquisition courts didn't even hold court. The German states, even rarer. Now, let's look at our next slide. 
Inquisitions typically involved a judicial process. You know what their aim was? To kill and torture. No. Confession and conversion. That was the aim. Local bishops working with local authorities under local... The ends were good. The means were a little messed up. Their goal was to secure a person's repentance from being heretical or to doing things that were heretical. If a person persisted, they were talked to, they were counseled. If a person consistently persisted in serious heresy, then he was turned over to the secular authorities. The church did not torture and kill them. They were turned over to the state who then sometimes did it. So the church isn't innocent here. The church turned them over, sometimes knowing that they would be tortured and killed. But the church didn't do it. But they could, you could say they were complicit in it. Okay? Okay. The church conducted the investigation and the trials, but punishment was left to the state, to the secular authorities. Most all torture in the Inquisition was carried out by France, Spain, and Italy. The nation states, not the church. In fact, it happened in Protestant states as well after the Reformation. In fact, in those places, the, the state did it all. Trial, investigation, punishment, it did it all. So let's watch a quick video. If you're here with us, please don't um, turn the sound on. You can watch this video later, but we're gonna have Mark show. It's just a two minute video. Now, let me give a little warning. This video is about the torture, types of torture that were used in the Inquisition to give you an idea. But I found a very gentle one, it's a cartoon. If you do have little children, Maybe this is a time, a little bit of a parental caution that you may not want them to see this part. I don't want to give anybody nightmares. But this little short two-minute video gives you an idea of some of the torture devices that were used. And here's what's interesting. By the state, not by the church. But I'll give you an idea. Let's watch this quick two-minute video. Let's look at some of the methods and devices used to inflict agony to torture and punish. The pillory. The pillory was a form of public shaming and humiliation. The prisoner would place their neck and wrists through holes in a hinged wooden board, therefore trapping them in place for everyone to see. Passers-by would then mock, spit at, or throw rotten vegetables or animal excrement at the criminal. There was also the danger that the criminal could be killed when the crowd became too violent whilst throwing stones or bricks. Thumb screws. This device would cause agony for the victim by pressing the thumbs in with a metal screw. As the victim's fingers were slowly crushed, a confession was extracted. The rack. The rack was a large rectangular wooden frame constructed with a roller at both ends. The criminal had their ankles fastened on one end and their wrists to the other. The torturer cracked a handle to stretch the victim during interrogation creating excruciating pain as limbs stretched from the body. The further the torturer went, the higher the chance of dislocation of muscles and ligaments, and loud popping sounds, and if they still failed to extract a confession, a ripping of limbs from the body. Breaking wheel. With the breaking wheel, the victim would have their limbs tied to the spokes and revolved while the torturer hit them with an iron hammer mangling their arms and legs and breaking their bones. They were then left out in the sun to the crows, burning at the stake. A horrific form of execution for blasphemers, thieves and witches would see them burnt at the stake. Usually the condemned would die from suffocation before the flames started to burn their flesh. The suffering of the condemned could be prolonged by the executioner by making the fire small, causing loss of blood and heat stroke. Iron Chair This instrument of torture was covered in spikes on the seat, back and arm rests. When the victim was forced to sit on the chair, the spikes pushed into the flesh, causing extreme pain, and blood loss occurred when they sat out of it. Okay, so that was just a little kind of an idea to give you of what methods were used, but again, the church's goal 
was not the execution of heretics, but conversion and salvation of souls. Okay? Now, the general laity usually wanted the heretic to die. The crowds and secular authorities wanted to punish them and torture them, and they did. The courts of the Inquisition, though, the church run, they hoped to bring the person back into the church. The guidelines were strict against using torture or punishment. Now, again, I'm not making this up. This is historical documentation. Shows no priest or religious was allowed to take an active role in torture. This is false. The use of torture in the Inquisition courts was very rare, wasn't really happen. And when it was a lot less violent than the secular courts, if it happened at all. Now, what type of crimes were tried? Okay, here's what's interesting. Protestant reformers portrayed our inquisi um, inquisition courts as being aimed at Bible-loving Christians because they love the Bible. You've heard this, haven't you? The church put them to death because they simply read the Bible. False. Those prosecuted were not people reading the Bible. You know who they were for the most part? They were basically troublemakers, often drunkards, often publicly intoxicated, quote, belching out foolishness while under the influence of alcohol. Those are mainly the ones. Now, much like any court today, the Inquisition courts, they functioned as a form of social try to control, aimed at those who lived a bad life, trying to reform them. Now, here's the thing, those who were on trial was not because they read the Bible. Fornication, adultery, not going to the sacraments, disregard of common decency. This is what the Inquisition courts focused on. You never, ever read that. Many Inquisition courts, the major focus, as I said before, was on the clergy, not living their life. So, all of this is a misconception. Well, what about science, Father? Didn't, didn't the Inquisition and the church try to destroy science? Okay, let's look at our next slide. There's Galileo. Another talk I'm going to do in the future. No, Inquisitions rarely got involved in the area of science, despite Galileo in 1633. Now, he said, I'll tell you real quick, I, I won't get into Galileo, but you know the story of Galileo? No, the church, yeah, we get a black eye for this, but you know the truth of Galileo? No, the church didn't squash science. Galileo said the earth revolves around the sun. First of all, it wasn't his work. It was that was the work of a Catholic priest named Copernicus. Basically, Galileo stole that and developed it and said the earth revolves around the sun. You know what the church said? Throw him in chains, throw him in the dungeon, torture him mercifully until he denies science. False. You know what happened with Galileo? The church said, this appears to be contradicting scripture, that the earth is the center of the universe. So please, teach it, but only as an hypothesis, which it was only an hypothesis at the time. Don't teach it as scientific fact yet. We don't know. Teach it as a hypothesis. So they did. He did. But he taught it as fact. He taught it as scientific fact. Now, he happened to be right. But he taught it as historical fact. That was what the church asked him not to do. Because they said it is, appears to contradict scripture. So you know the church's crime in that? Trying to protect scripture. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Now he can be, obey, disobeyed, and that was the problem. Now let's continue to go on. This is another good work by Robert Lockwood, uh, one of the authors and researchers. He said, the Inquisition in Spain was controlled not by the church, but Spanish authorities, not by the papacy. Let's look at our next slide. You know who that is? Y'all remember Christopher Columbus, King Ferdinand, and Queen Isabella? 
Christopher Columbus, this is them. They ordered the expulsion of Jews in Spain and some Muslims. The hope on their part was conversion. But those are the ones who didn't convert. Most evidence indicates that their motivation was good. It was religious. But whatever their motivation, the results became a mess. Okay, first Jews fled. Second, some did, did convert. But that aggravated the Christians in Spain because they thought they only converted for political gain. So all the way through 1530, the primary activity of the Spanish inquisitions was aimed at these people, not the Protestants. It was aimed at these converted Jews and Muslims, conversos. Now, what happened? Records, go to the primary documents. Don't believe some rogue author, but the primary documents of the Spanish Inquisition show that the main thing prosecuted was the alleged secret practice of the Muslim and Jewish faith, not Protestants. Now, the only heretics were really those who had made crude, usually drunk, as we said, anti-religious statements. They were prosecuted for anti-church or clerical behavior, an apostasy. But most were the Jews and the Muslims that converted and still practiced their faith. It wasn't even against the Protestants. Now, the image of this Spanish Inquisition torturing and killing hundreds of thousands of people, simple Bible-believing Protestants, has no basis in historical fact, according to Robert Lockwood. Because you know why? You know why? There were no Protestants in Spain at the time. How could the Protestants, the whole country was Catholic, Muslim, and Jew? How could the Spanish Inquisition be burning Protestants at the stake when there were no Protestants in Spain at the time? People don't understand this. Prior to 1558, historians estimate that there were probably fewer than 50 cases, 50 cases of Lutheranism, and the Spanish did try. So although there were no Spanish, I mean, no considerable numbers, they came up with, they believe, 40. So if you find one case in history, you can write me, because I'm sure there was, according to the researchers, up to 40, not 95 million. Okay, let's look at the most famous of all. I get this one all the time. I could say, you know, it's a beautiful day today. Let's go to 12 o'clock mass. What about William Tyndale? You Catholics burned him at the stake for reading his Bible. William Tyndale, a martyr, a hero, and he was betrayed by a Catholic bishop and put to death by a Catholic church. Do you know William Tyndale? You know the story? Yeah, he was put to death. But you know the real story of William Tyndale? And you know what? Secular media doesn't even deny this anymore. You can find this on Wikipedia. He was betrayed by Henry Phillips, not a Catholic, and turned over to authorities representing the Holy Roman Empire, not the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Hmm, interesting. Some say he was betrayed. Father, I got one letter that said, I didn't know what I was talking about because in one of my talks before last year or so, um, I didn't mention he was betrayed by Bishop Stokesley. And somebody wrote me and said, I don't have any idea what I'm talking about because I never mentioned he was betrayed by Bishop Stolkesky, um, Stolkesley. You know what? Even if that's true, he wasn't a Catholic bishop. Bishop Stolkesky, or um, Stolkesley was part of the English church under Henry VIII. He was not Catholic. Interesting. Tyndale, when they executed him, you know his last words? His last words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Not open the eyes of the Catholic Church. Open the eyes of the English King. He was executed by the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V on behalf of the King of England. Nothing to do with the Catholic Church. 
Yet I can't count how many letters I got on Tyndale and how awful and rotten and satanic the Catholic Church is for burning this poor man who simply wanted to read the Bible. God bless you for caring about your faith, but please, I beg you, learn the truth. Next, this misunderstanding of the Spanish Inquisition, like I said, the worst of all of them. The myth of this Inquisition grew out of the 16th century Reformation propaganda. This is when it all started. Now, the uh, Spanish Inquisition ended, was ended by the monarchy in 1834, so it did go for a while. Although in the ending years, the last few centuries, it really was basically over. Now, it was established, nobody's gonna deny this, by papal approval. It was, but at the request of King Ferdinand and Isabella. The Spanish Inquisition quickly was taken over by the monarchy. Yes, it was authorized by the church. Again, we acknowledge that. But it was taken over by the monarchy. It had strong and ugly racial overtones against the Jews and the Muslims. We're not gonna deny that. And at the end of this talk, we'll tell you the mistakes. It was aimed at them. But the number actually persecuted for such being Muslim or Jew was very small, very small. Oddly enough, the building of this myth, total myth of the Spanish Inquisition, had little to do with what its real problem was, racially against the Jews and Muslims, against the Jewish and Muslim Catholics that had converted. That was really the problem, and that's not, that's not the myth. And anyway, if the Inquisition if this was mostly legend, should we ignore it? No, there cannot be denying that these courts existed. Well, Father John Paul II, I got this letter. John Paul II apologized for the Inquisition. Is this true? Yes, he apologized, but listen to what he apologized. John Paul II at the beginning of the new millennium said, quote, men of the church in the name of faith and morals have sometimes used methods not in keeping with the Gospels in the solemn duty of defending truth. Notice he said defending truth is a duty. The end of what they were trying to do was a duty. But notice he said sometimes they use the wrong methods, the means. The end didn't justify the means. Now, the Inquisition is proof that the church does have sinners and people who make wrong decisions. But it is also a classic example of what happens when myth runs amok and we own Catholics don't know our own faith to defend it. Now, it is true that those who represent the church can be caught up in the way they live as not being good. We have it all over the place today. We got bishops kneeling in honor of social uh, militant movements that go against everything the Catholic Church teaches. Abortion, transgenderism, gay marriage, Marxism, destruction of the patriarchy, and we got Catholic bishops kneeling in support of it. The Catholic Church teaching on sexuality and marriage has been totally, totally consistent since the time of beginning of mankind. And we got Catholic priests out there writing books promoting homosexuality in the act in amongst Catholics. This is what the problem is. This is the problem. So to finish here, we've got wrapping up. What about this idea of cackling monks? Cackling monks as they were attached to torture devices and the monks would be there cackling. Wow. These, you know, and you could just picture this myth of these cackling monks as they say, wielding gruesome instruments of torture and heretics being burned by thousands at the stakes. Well, there were no cackling monks. Church did not allow priests or religious to participate in torture. Civil authorities conducted the torture, as I said, to elicit information. So when we look back at this, torturing was commonplace amongst all judicial systems in Europe at the time. And it did not start with the church, it started with Roman law. Now they gave an edict of grace, allowing people to, to, to revert, to confess, to be able to come back multiple times. 
without ever being punished. The trial was not considered a means to determine guilt or innocence. Rather, the trial was meant to solicit conversion. Can you really blame someone trying to save your soul? Yes, the method, I agree. I mean, if you want to save my soul, I hope you're not going to tie me to a wheel and spin me around and torture me. The means aren't right. But the trial was not to determine this guilt or innocent, but conversion. Torture was never conducted by clergy, as we said, but they paid, the church didn't, the state paid professionals. You ever see those guys with the executioner with the hood on and the ax? Those were paid executioners by the state. They were not monks. A lot of people say they were monks that wore those dark black headdresses, head coverings, so that they couldn't see that they were the monks. Man, how did this come? How did this happen? Such gross misteaching of history. Torture, as we said, you know, the accused were given three opportunities to change their drunken ways and, 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 and publicly slandering the truth of the faith. Kind of like Jesus in St. Faustina Diary, 1486. He used to come to the, it says he comes to the soul three times and gives him three chances. You know, the Inquisition court came to you three times and gave you three chances. Way different than what we hear. We hear stories that people were busted in their homes, never given a warning, ripped from their table, innocently reading the Bible, and thrown in the fire to be burned. False, false, false. Wow. So unlike these medieval inquisitions in much of Europe, in the Spanish Inquisition, they were allowed legal counsel. They were allowed an attorney. Mostly, counsel helped the accused person to explain why they did what they did. For instance, I was drunk. These were church trials, yes. And you know what the conclusion of the church trial was? If you were found guilty of heresy, you know what your, pen, you know what your conclusion was? You were given the penance. You were given a penance, and you were pronounced by the church to please do the penance and please convert. It was only after three times and after stubborn, obstinate, serious heresy, they turned him over to the state. Yeah, maybe they shouldn't have because they know they probably would have been tortured and killed at that point. So that's the church's fault. But as in most medieval inquisitions, the majority of cases did not involve outright heresy. It was just telling these people to live a better life. Stop fornicating. Stop teaching false doctrine. Stop living in adultery. Stop blaspheming. That was the majority of the cases. All right, charges would be brought against those seriously unrepentant or relapsing into heresy. Those who were deemed guilty were then turned over. It should be noted that after the bitter persecution of those conversos, the Jewish converts, the first two decades of the Spanish Inquisition, few, very few were actually executed. All right, now we're gonna finish with this last part a lot of people. Let's go to our next slide. Auto da fe. Auto da fe. What is this? That literally means, you know, first of all, before I tell you what it literally means, how many non Catholics will use that term? Auto da fe. The church burning, killing, murdering. You know what that means literally? They don't even know what that means. It literally means an act of faith. Not, that term does not mean kill the heretic. It's a request to make an act of faith. Now, artists would paint these auto de fe's, and they were always done by anti-Catholic propaganda, having these wild-eyed crowds, you've all seen these pictures, salivating as the heretic was tortured and burned in the public square. I did my research for this study I've been doing for a while, and these pictures are everywhere. My goodness, if I'm a young Catholic now, 14, 15 years old, and my own Catholic brethren at my Catholic school don't know my own, our own faith, and my parents don't know my, our own faith, 
And somebody comes and shows me those pictures, I'd be like, what the heck am I doing as a Catholic? What am I doing? Why am I a Catholic? You got to understand what those pictures are. Those were fabricated anti-Catholic propaganda. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't a gathering of people that watched a public execution, but it was conducted by the state. I can't emphasize that enough. The reality was that an auto de fe was a unique aspect of the Spanish Inquisition and actually one of the most misunderstood. You know what the auto de fe usually included? Not an execution, a public execution. You know what it included? It included a liturgical act of faith, usually held in the public square after the Inquisition trial was over. It involved, oh, how horrible, mass, prayer, reading of the Bible, and a possession of the guilty. I can't imagine anything more torturous. Come on. Seriously? It was a religious act stressing that the hoped for reconciliation of the heretic would happen. The auto de fe's, these had no torture and no burning. I'm sure, again, there were public gatherings of torture and burning, but not the auto de fe's. If execution did take place, it was done separately from the auto de fe and far less public. History created by Reformation polemics is not history. It is just Catholic urban legend. Hmm. The kinds and degrees of punishment inflicted by the Spanish Inquisition were similar or even lighter, most of the times lighter than the secular courts. People wanted their cases heard by the Catholic Church. Do you ever hear this? It is equally true that many people preferred to go to the ecclesiastical court, not the secular. I have this, all the data for this. Historian Edward Peters sums it up when he said, what it was not. This is what the Spanish Inquisition was not. Explaining bluntly that the Inquisition of myth, quote, a single, all-powerful, horrific tribunal whose agents worked (coughs) everywhere to thwart religious truth, intellectual freedom, and political liberty by killing anyone who didn't conform simply never existed. Period. He explains that the Inquisition is the name of a legal method, and it didn't even start, as we said, with the Catholic Church. So an Inquisition was simply a particular method of inquiry, just like we read in the Bible, that produced evidence, and then the person was pleaded to live a right life. The Spanish Inquisition came after centuries of war between the Spaniards and the Muslims who occupied Spain. Last page. Last couple paragraphs. The popes, yeah, they did authorize the Inquisition in Spain at the request of King Ferdinand and Isabella, as we said. We're not denying that, okay? But they tried to rein it in. The problem was the monarchy ran with it. So you could say we created the monster, but the state really made it a monster. Far from being a tyrannical imposition by the church upon the state, it came about at the request of King Ferdinand and Isabella, not the Catholic Church. And the people as a whole, they supported it. Another scholar and theologian, Henry Kamen, a noted historian of the Inquisition, says all of Spain had only about 50 inquisitors. They would have needed a much bigger team if they were to carry out 95 million deaths. The actual fact, the Spanish Inquisition was really irreverent, uh, irrelevant in most of Spain. As we said before in the beginning of this talk, the total number of victims, a few thousand. Still wrong. All execution, though, as we said, was not by the church. So anyway, does this mean that nothing wrong happened? Let us finish. No, it doesn't. There were things that happened that were wrong in the Inquisition. We're not denying that. John Paul II acknowledged that at the day of repentance in the year 2000. 
one of the confessions um, was a confession of sins committed in service of the truth. Notice again, service of the truth. That was not the problem. The sin was in the way it was conducted because that is the core of the whole Inquisition that you'll never hear about. The point of the Inquisition was to compel people to believe, lead a good life, and follow the truth. This is not a bad thing. How they did it. Chris Sparks in his book, Why Be Catholic, said it really well. He said, the problem with this is that truth should be its own source of compulsion. You shouldn't have to force the truth. Interesting. He said, truth does not fail. Forcing an individual to profess beliefs that he doesn't truly believe isn't really keeping in line with his right and his duty. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, rights and duty of dignity of the human person. In other words, we don't put them on a torture chamber and make them profess, I believe. What we try to do is get to their heart. We try to explain to them our faith, what it really teaches. That's the whole purpose of these 107 episodes. Now, this is a crime against the truth if you're going to torture somebody to acknowledge the truth. The truth itself will compel, not a torture device. If you compel them through a torture device, you're compelling them to lie. They don't really believe it. You got to get to their heart so they really do believe it. Truth can compel only by force of reason or experience of reality, he says. It can never legitimately compel someone by physical force. I agree. That's the mistake the Catholic Church made. Now, bringing people to the knowledge of the truth, this is good. You know you're obligated to do that, don't you? Now, don't get a guillotine out. But you got to bring people to the truth. I just saw another one of those on our comments with the Father Kaz and myself. And Father Kaz, thank you for bringing us love. And Father Chris, thank you for bringing us the truth. <laughs> God bless. You need both. Violating, though, their conscience and integrity of their mind in order to force them to accept it? Now, nah, that's not the right way to do it. All right. Wrong was done in the service of the good. Let me repeat that. Wrong was done in the service of the good. But nobody will teach you that the intent was good. Everybody will teach you the intent was evil. The church was not simply out for power or gain or to crush opposition. She was pursuing the salvation of souls as best she knew at the time. Now we know better. Now we know better. You can't... All right, let me give this one example. If somebody has a knee replacement from 1980 and it doesn't have the most up-to-date titanium, perfectly executed modes of science, are we going to go back and blame that doctor in 1980? Are we going to say that that doctor in 1980 did a really horrible, horrendous, rotten job for what he knew at the time and what he believed at the time? That's what he did. You can't hold somebody accountable in 1492 for what we understand and now know in 2022. That's the problem with wiping out history in our schools. That's the problem with the woke movement. Crush the founding fathers, destroy them. Did anybody ever stop and take a look at the context of the times? You can't study history without the context of the times. And that's exactly the same with the Bible. You don't read the Bible by isolating a single scripture passage. You got to read it in the context of the whole. So, to finish, we now know better. The principle upon which the Inquisition was built is defensible. 
Indeed, Catholics everywhere have a duty to defend the truth. The church was given by Christ himself the mission of safeguarding the deposit of the faith from distortion and corruption. Don't believe me? <clears throat> Father, there's no way we should defend the truth. Well, Matthew 28, 16 through 20, Mark 16, 14 through 20, John 21, 15 through 19, 1 Thessalonians 2, chapter, verse 13, Jude 3, Catechisms 84 through 90, 70, 172 through 175, 813 through 816, I can go on and on. We are commanded by God to bring souls to him, to defend the truth. But we must distinguish between this principle and the means by which faith should be defended. Shouldn't be defended with a torture chamber. The church herself is seen and says in the catechism, it doesn't defend these regrettable practices of the Middle Ages. Just like in Canada, we shouldn't defend the horrible tragedy of those children dying. But what we got to do is understand the reason. There is some truth about abuses that Catholics, we must admit. Unrepentant men found guilty of heresy were allowed to be handed over the state for punishment. You could say the church was complicit. Even though church authorities didn't always agree with it, they still did it. We must realize in handing over the condemned heretics to the state, the church knowingly handed over a person to be killed sometimes. And does that make us innocent? No. But it also doesn't mean we were holding the tool of execution. We tried to convert them. Only those who stubbornly and obstinately would not change their lives. And most of all, not even theology. It was mostly drunkenness and, and doing things that the society saw as being very harmful. Again, Good mean, uh, excuse me, good ends, not good means. So finish. Further, with all these precautions, there were inquisitors who did not follow the laws of the church and handled it the wrong way. The church, following the customs of the day, did allow sometimes torture as part of the process. Didn't do it, but sometimes allowed it. The approval of torture went all the way up. Pope Innocent the fourth. Again, we're not denying that. His papal bull in 1252 allowed it. Again, didn't do it. Still wrong. However, the use of torture during the inquiry, again, was not the invention of the church. Roman law begun to take over Europe. So I finish with our last slide, our last comment. This is John Paul II, quote, the truth cannot impose itself except by virtue of its own truth. And it wins over the mind with both gentleness and power, end quote. Basically what John Paul was saying in regards to the Inquisition was, yeah, the ends were good, the intent was good, the method and the I'm sorry, the ends were good, the intent was good, but the means and the method were not. That's all you have to know. But we are told as Catholics that we carried out, that we killed 95 million people, that we burned them at the stake. Our monks tortured them. False. You know, we said before, the ends don't justify the means. But what we do have to realize is neither do the accusations. Know the truth of your faith. Know why you are Catholic. Again, I said, if I was 16 years old and I was told that the Catholic Church did this, I too would say, why the heck am I Catholic? Let us please teach our loved ones the truth. I just took you back to seminary with me to my church history class. I am forever grateful for what I learned in seminary, what I could share with you, and I'm forever grateful for the theologians that I can consult with today, the names that I just mentioned earlier, the names I read to you during this report. They give you the truth of what really happened. Don't be afraid to be Catholic. Understand the truth, because the truth will set us free. Amen?
Hallelujah. Well, God bless everybody. And I, no, thank you. Thank you. I wanted to finish with that is why the beauty of our Catholic faith is unity because the church back then, even then saw that this was a harm to unity. If people were crazy living wild lives, we want to bring them back into the fold. Brother Mark, please show the next slide. MICprayers.org. Please join our Marian family. Become a Marian helper. It doesn't cost anything. It only takes a few seconds. Visit MICprayers.org and become a Marian family member of ours. I don't care. I've said this before. If you ever donate a penny, and I always say yes if you can. God bless you because we still need to keep these lights on and this video coming to you. But if you can't, God bless you. That's not the point. The point is you can receive the graces as if you were a Marian priest or brother from all our masses, rosaries, prayers, penances, just like you were a Marian priest or brother. It's incredible. And I want to, two few last announcements. Please join us. I know this tape will remind up there for maybe ho hopefully a couple of years, but coming up this August 27th, uh, 2022, we invite all of you, if you're watching this, you know somebody in the upstate New York area, please spread the word. We're going to be doing our only Marian Divine Mercy Conference from the past several years. These conferences in Buffalo were done way before I became a Marian. It's been a tradition, and then we stopped it. Now we're bringing it back. We'll be at Our Lady of Victories in Lackawanna, New York. And Holy Face Ministry is going to be helping us. God bless them. But we've got some great speakers, Stephen Ray, Teresa Tamio, Kelly Walquist. Please join us. It'll be a great afternoon. I'd love to meet you. Sign your books. And speaking of books, the last two slides. If you haven't gotten the books, um, Live, Understanding Divine Mercy, this is a book. It's an easy read. It, it, you can do it in a weekend. You can visit shopmercy.org or call us at 800-462-7426. Or the last slide, God bless all of you who may have struggled through a suicide of a loved one, family, or friend. Um, please visit suicideandhope.com. There you can enter the names of your loved ones for us to pray for and offer masses for. Um, this book will help for any kind of tragedy or loss, not just suicide, if you've lost someone to cancer, accident, or any separation. Again, you can visit suicideandhope.com or also shopmercy.org. And um, if you'd like to go to the Buffalo Conference, Peter is actually in today. If you're watching this live, you can call him at 413-298-1303. Well, I'm sweating to death, but God bless you because our faith is beautiful. And if we truly know, remember Fulton Sheen said millions of people hate what they think is the Catholic Church, but very few, if any, hate what is actually the Catholic Church. God bless you and thank you very much. How exactly will the judgment occur? When we appear before our Lord after death, will the Lord tell us, you go to hell, you go to purgatory, and you with me to heaven? Nothing like that. God is the good Father. We will see God face to face with open arms. And it is we who will say, No, Father, I cannot get close. My clothes are stained. How can I appear like this before all saints and angels? I'll change my stained clothes. I'll go to purgatory and dress nicely. Then I will come and be with you forever. Purgatory is the place that cleanses us. 